Ministry of Christ Web. Good evening and welcome to the Wednesday night Christ Bible Church Bible study. I'm Pastor Joe Jackowitz. It's a blessing to study God's word with all of you. And we continue our study in the book of First John. So if you have a Bible, turn over to First John chapter one. We will read verses one through chapter two and verse one. So 1 John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So I don't see any new students. So most, if, if not all of you are very familiar with the context of 1 John that we have read here, 1 John 1 verse one through chapter two and verse one. The main theme of first John you will remember is fellowship with God. And <clears throat> we have arrived at chapter two and verses one and two. We will finish up verse one tonight where we read my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The two most important phrases in this verse are advocate with the Father and Jesus Christ the righteous. Now, as you know, fellowship with God is the main theme of 1 John, and it's such an important theme because if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you are not born again and know him in your hearts and are born from above, you're not interested in fellowship with God. You're not interested in the book of 1 John or studying the truths in 1 John because the theme of it is all about helping us as Christians deepen our fellowship with God and to be able to, to expand our communion and knowledge of God. We are confronted immediately in verse three with, with uh, the problem of sin, um, and in verse seven, rather, with the problem of sin. It's the biggest hindrance to fellowship with God. And there is much information and truth in this epistle that addresses the problem of sin, how to overcome it, and remove any obstacles in the way of our fellowship with God. Let me ask you a question. More than anything in the world, do you value your fellowship with God? Do you value it? Is it more important to you than anything else? Knowing God, walking with God, maintaining short accounts with God, growing in the grace and knowledge of God, knowing Christ in your hearts and enjoying, enjoying his peace and love, being single-minded and maintaining the purity of your marriage, spiritual marriage with Jesus Christ? Is that more important to you than anything in the world? Well, God in his great mercy and grace 
gave us the book of first john to teach us how to do that and how to grow and expand communion and fellowship with god while we are in this world god wants his church to be holy and he teaches us how to be holy and how to know him to know him in his heart and for him to know you in your heart this spiritual union and communion this oneness the spiritual oneness is the very reason why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to purchase for himself a holy church, a royal priesthood, a godly people who know him. And to be able to know him and continue to deepen our fellowship with him over our lifetime, we learn in First John 1, that we need to walk with God in a very certain, specific way based on instructions and conditions that he gives to us. He says, if we walk with him in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And so that's verse seven. And so in order to walk, walk with God in the light, which means a place of holiness or on a level morally and spiritually that he is on, we have to be, we, we have to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ from sins that are committed afresh. Therefore, our daily walk must be a top priority if we are to maintain our walk with God. Now, the Bible teaches that God hates sin, and therefore his people hate sin. If we know God and we are walking with him, then we will hate sin as God hates sin. And therefore, we learn in 1 John that God does not want us to sin. He says in chapter 2, verse 1, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. God clearly reminds us he does not want us to sin. And therefore, God gives us a very clear teaching and theology and understanding of what sin is, how much God hates it, and he provides remedies for us through the Lord Jesus Christ and faith in him to control sin and to overcome sin when we commit it. And so... It's critical that in maintaining and sustaining fellowship with God, that we understand how much God hates sin, how much God loathes sin and abhors sin. And therefore, so should you and so should me, if we have had our consciences cleansed by the blood of Christ, a fresh sense of hatred for sin will flood our souls and will reject and cast out all love for the world and the things of the world and, and love for sin. And so in verse one of chapter two, God does not want us to sin. That's why he's writing the book of first John to us not just to warn us, but actually to teach us to stop sinning, to reduce the frequency of our sinning. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, don't be deceived, verse 33, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness and do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So the Corinthian Christians had at least temporarily lost the present knowledge of God, the regular experience of renewing the hard knowledge of Jesus Christ in their daily walk. They had, had become worldly. And he tells them that evil company corrupts good habits. He reminds them if they have unsaved worldly companions and friends, 
their godly habits, their good habits will be corrupted. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 33. One of the worst things about sin is that it tends to deceive and to blind and to make us susceptible to the lies of Satan. So Paul rebukes them. He says, don't be deceived. Don't listen to the lie. If, if you are falling into a pattern of worldliness and keeping company with unsaved people, your godly habits will be corrupted and you will feel the terrible effect of that in your lively fellowship with God. Your fellowship with the Lord will greatly weaken. So he wants us to wake up he does not want us to be deceived any longer with regard to sin. It affects and hinders fellowship with God. He wants us to awaken to righteousness, 1 Corinthians 15, 34. And he says, do not sin. You, you and I sin, and the Corinthians obviously developed the habit temporarily of sinning because they, they entered into worldly company without repentance and it affected their fellowship with God. So let me ask you a question. Uh, have you fallen into a habit of worldliness? Have you secretly entered into illicit relationships? Not necessarily physically, but where you've committed your emotions and your affections to an unsafe person based on the lust of the flesh or the lust of an unconverted personality, which has diminished your sensitivity to sin and the world and the temptations of the devil. If that is taking place, then your fellowship with God is interrupted and your conscience has been defiled and you have become somewhat desensitized to the sin of worldliness. Going back to 1 Corinthians. 15 and verse 34, he says, awake to righteousness and do not sin. Stop committing the sin of worldliness. Wake up again to your love for God. Wake up again to your hunger and thirst for fellowship with God. Wake up again, awaken to righteousness, imparted righteousness, which God, which God freshly pours out on the dry ground of our hearts when we repent of sin and flee fornication and flee worldliness. For some do not have the knowledge of God. And so believers, like some of these uh, Corinthian believers, and I would imagine some of them are unconverted religious professors of Christianity, but not possessors. Paul tells them in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, examine yourselves whether you are in the faith. Prove yourselves. Prove it through your repentance, through fleeing worldliness, returning to Christ, trusting in him to wash away those sins that you have committed. They're forgiven sins, but repenting of that sin and returning to Christ, that will prove the fact that you are a genuine believer and God will return the heart knowledge afresh to you. This is very important because so many believers today and so many churches have become saturated with sensuality, with secret fornication, with abusing themselves with mankind, with homosexual thoughts and homosexual practices. So many pastors and church leaders have approved such practices because they don't want to offend anyone. But the true Christian is going to flee these things, not just because they're convicted in their consciences, but because they are miserable when their fellowship with God is broken. And so God commands us to flee fornication and to stop sinning. Now, I am not advocating the false unscriptural idea of what is called sinless perfectionism. 
I do not believe in that. It is unscriptural. The Bible says that uh, through the Apostle Paul, he says that uh, we will not uh, achieve perfection in this life. Not as though I had already become perfect, but I strive towards the mark. So our goal is to be perfect. And God commands us to be perfect. God commands us not to sin. We don't make any allowance for sin. We don't justify sin or scheme and make plans to sin. Because the Bible says, shall we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? And so the true Christian is going to repent of sin and is going to renew his loyalty and his love for Christ, is going to loathe and abhor and condemn his sin, and is going to repent of every single known sin. And if you are a believer, I remind you of Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20 of the precious words of our Lord Jesus Christ to the church of Laodicea, a church that has fallen into lukewarmness, a church that has fallen into mediocrity and has been dabbling in sin and pride. He says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. He's appealing to believers who have backslidden and have fallen into a place of temporary blindness, pride, egotism, superficiality in their relationship with God, and have not known the ways of the Lord for some time because sin has dominated their thoughts and they have yielded to it. I plead with you tonight with all my heart, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I plead with you to remember that you have a merciful Savior who's standing at the door of your heart, who perhaps, I don't know, I don't know, in the, in the last uh, day or two or week or two, has been knocking, has been seeking to gain your attention through various providential dealings with you, various um, activities, various biblical messengers that he has put directly in your way that you could not dismiss easily or avoid, that you have made mental note about that the Lord is trying to get your attention, but you have not yet repented. Remember what the Bible says, seek the Lord while is near. Call upon him while he may be found. And so Flee to the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior. Don't remain stiff-necked like the Jews did in the Old Testament. Don't wait another day. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Repent of that worldliness, of any kind of things you have been looking upon publicly, at the television or in secret that has grieved the Holy Spirit of God. Repent of that sin and flee to Christ while he, while he is near and while he is convicting you. It is his mercy and his love that, that for you as a child, as his purchased possession, based on his jealousy, based on his sacrifice to not only justify you and save you but to sanctify you and to make you holy in his commitment of love that nothing not even your own sin and stubbornness will separate you from the love of God where is your softened heart where is your love for Christ who died who gave up his life for you you and me, so unworthy. Listen to the voice of the Lord. And 1 John is all about that. 1 John is all about believers listening 
to the message and the doctrine of dealing with sin. More, they call it mortification, killing sin, crucifying, nailing sin to the cross of sanctification. Sins which have already been forgiven, but sins that we bring back to the Lord Jesus Christ and ask him for fresh cleansing. Will you do that tonight? Why would you delay? Oh, there, there is a sin that leads to death, the Bible says. There is a sin where if we commit it and if we cross over the line of resistance and rebellion and stubbornness, the Bible says, we are saved in such a situation, and yet so as by fire, God will take us. If not at his second coming, he will take us if we cross over that line of persistent rebellion and, and resistance. We see that happening where there were believers in Corinth who persistently did not prepare themselves for the Lord's Supper. And they came into the house of God flippantly, unprepared. To worship God with an internal witness of having been cleansed afresh in that fountain for sin and for uncleanness, the precious blood of Christ. And they played games with God in approaching holy communion. And God, some, many were sick and many slept. That is, many got killed by the Holy Spirit. Like uh, Ananias and Sapphira, who lied to the Holy Spirit, they crossed over that line and God took them. And we see many today professing Christians who are dying because they refuse to repent of sin, to cut off those hands and pluck out those eyes and cut off those feet in dealing with sensuality, sexual sin, immorality, which has is drowning drowning the church and may God have mercy of any members of Christ Bible Church who are dabbling in such sin or any unrepentant sin any unrepentant sin the sin of gossip and slander the sin of judging one another in our thoughts which are going uh, without repentance the sin of delaying repentance and being disobedient to the Holy Spirit who is striving with us and we are grieving him and quenching his gracious and holy work to bring us to repentance. May God have mercy. May God all have mercy upon any member of Christ Bible Church that insists on keeping up a propped up profession of faith without the substance being there in consistency and obedience in our hearts. Do we want to go to heaven? Do we want to be real Christians and not just Sunday Christians, then we need to listen to the voice of Christ who loves us, who refuses to let go of us until he gives us ears to hear what the spirit is saying to the church. I, for one, I refuse to be a pastor. And Pastor Owen Alford, he's still with us. Where is he? He's here. He and Lori. Refuse to be pastors of a church that dabbles in the in superficial Christianity. It's substance or nothing. And once in a while, we've got to bring up such issues because sin is deceitful. Sin deceitful. It is, it is called the exceeding deceitfulness of sin. And the reason, there's a reason why it's called that. There's a reason why we read in Jeremiah 17, 9 that the heart is deceitful above all things that can be deceitful. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked without hope. There is no human remedy for the deceitfulness of the human heart and remaining in dwelling sin. Who can know it? We so quickly lapse back into a state of, of spiritual seduction and satanic delusion because Satan uses a lack of repentance and a lack of faith in the blood, the sanctifying blood of Christ, and a lack of responding quickly to the overtures of mercy and love and kindness and compassion of the Lord to, to delude us more deeply. 
You and I have no right. No right. We are not our own. We have been bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, God commands us in 2 Corinthians 6 and in 1 Corinthians 6 to glorify God in our body and in our spirits, which are God's. You have no right to take your body and lay it on the altar of the flesh and turn it over as an instrument of unrighteousness. It is not your body and it is not my body. Christ died and it is his body. And the body is the Lord's and not ours. The body is for the Lord and not our whimsical ways and our spirit too. If we're to have victory in overcoming sin, as we read in chapter one of verse two, we've got to deal with those things that would pollute and defile our spirits, our spirits. They are God's spirit. And he has raised your spirit and my spirit from the dead. And we are alive in Christ and we have a new nature and we are to cultivate and we are to nurture our spirits because they are God's, not ours anymore. And they never were ours. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And you're a Christian. Are you a Christian or not? Do you want to be a real Christian or do you want to play Christian? This is something that you will have to wrestle with if you hope to enjoy more peace with God. And remember, that's what the Lord says in verse four. Look at verse four of chapter one in first John. These things have I written to you that your joy may be full. God wants you to have more joy in your life. That's why he wrote this book. He says, these things have I written to you. I'm writing this to you. <laughs> that your joy may be full. And then he says in chapter two and verse one, these things that I'm, I'm writing to you, that you don't sin. And so notice the, the matter of more joy and less sin. Those two truths are integ integrally affecting fellowship with God. The more you deal with your sin and mortify it and control it by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the cleansing blood of Christ, being washed and purified every day in that blood by faith in Jesus Christ, the more you will have joy. You will have joy. He wants you to have joy. That's why he wrote that statement. I'm writing these things that your joy may be full. He doesn't want us to, to have joy once a decade, once a year, but a, but a constant abundance of joy. Jesus said, I came to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. Let's continue our study. So as we learned last time, God hates sin because it is the very opposite of his nature. He hates sin because he is holy. He hates sin because sin separates us, his children from him temporarily anyway. God hates sin because it blinds us, his children, to the truth he is constantly trying to teach us and to remind us about. God hates sin because sin tends to dominate us and enslave us and try to have us go backwards and destroy us. God hates sin because it lessens and weakens our love for him. And remember, the two greatest commandments in the Bible the fulfillment of which lie at the very heart of fellowship with God is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. Those two commandments cannot be obeyed and fulfilled with integrity and with purity if we don't deal with sin. Sin is a wall that prevents the love of God from being poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us, Romans 5.5. 5. And so if you are to experience fresh love from heaven, 
If you are to be able to fulfill the greatest commandment in the Bible so that you can look at God eyeball to eyeball, so to speak, and say, God, I love you, and have nothing holding you back in your heart by way of a guilty conscience, then you need to deal with sin. None of us can pray to God with hypocrisy because God knows everything. He knows the truth. He knows what's in our hearts. He knows our motives. And we dare not lie to him. Therefore, how are we going to obey the greatest commandment, let alone commandments of, of, lesser, uh, of lesser nature, unless we have the love of God that has been stirred up and rejuvenated afresh by, by fellowship with God, fresh fellowship with God, unless we deal with our sin. Do you make it a priority when you wake up in the morning, shortly after you wake up? Do you make it a priority sometime during the daytime to spend extra time in reading the Bible and praying? Do you make it a priority to keep up on the integrity and the moral cleansing of your heart during the day? That's what God has called you to. As a Christian, you didn't get saved just to do your own thing. You got saved so that you can lay your life down afresh every single day on the altar of service and fellowship and love for Jesus Christ. And so, brethren, tonight, not tomorrow morning, tonight, if God is speaking to your heart, and if he's not speaking to your heart, God have mercy on you. I don't know what else to say in my own words to get through unless the Holy Spirit gets through to you. But May God in his love for you and his mercy give you enough grace to have dealings with him tonight. You say, I'm tired. I got to get up in the morning. I have a, you don't know, know my situation. No, won't fly, won't fly. All I know is a believer truly loves Christ in spite of all the morass of sin and all the interruptions and all the complications of our sin when the Holy Spirit speaks to our heart about where we should be in our love relationship with the Lord, the true Christian is going to listen and is going to respond. He may not respond perfectly. He may not or she may not respond the way he, wants, he or she wants to, but there will be something of our hearts that will go out to the Lord as a witness that God is speaking the truth to me and to my situation. Is he speaking to you tonight, my dear brother, my dear sister, whom I love? I don't know about you, but God is constantly speaking to me every single day on this very point. I almost died six times, came that close to death in the last six years. And God has been reminding me, Joe, what do I have to do to get your attention on maintaining a clear conscience, clean hands, and a pure heart, and close fellowship with me. With, without letting one day go by, what do I have to do? Do I have to bring you near death another six times? Don't allow, don't, don't force God out of the fact that he loves whom he chastises, whom the Lord, Lord loves, he chastises, and scourges every son whom he receives. Don't put God in that position like he did with national Israel many times. And the very book of 1 John says in a couple of more chapters, there is a sin leading to death. He says, I dare not say what it is, but there is that sin. And he's speaking to Christians. Read chapter 1. He says in... in uh, Verse 1 of chapter 2, my little children, these things I'm writing to you, speak it to Christians. This Christian life demands constant oversight, supervision of our souls. It demands, it, you can't play games and think you can survive the spiritual battles and attacks just by going to church on Sunday and hearing a reminder. That reminder through the preaching and teaching of the word of God on the Lord's day or on Wednesday night Bible study will make you more culpable and accountable to God's chastisement. If you don't do the things that God tells you to do, it's only in the doing of it 
not the hearing of it, but in the doing of it, where you become blessed and you, you're able to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make that provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. And so the ultimate and severest consequences of sin is death. And so we don't want to go down that road. Yet, you know, I've heard people say, and they want to believe that God is so loving that he will overlook our little faults and our lapses and our indiscretions. Just the opposite. God is so loving, he won't overlook it. Because as I said, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. He's so loving that as he loves his children so much, he chases them, just like any loving parent would do their child. There's no such thing as little white lies that God will sweep under the rug or cheating on your tax return. And it's okay, you know, or taking that paperclip or that pen when no one is looking at work or overlooking secret sins. These are, uh, these are peccadillos that are not worthy of death, right? Wrong. The problem is sin is sin, big or small. God has one standard. He hates sin, all sin. And though God loves us, his holiness is such that he cannot live with evil. He cannot withstand evil. He cannot walk with his child as long as they harbor sin. The prophet Habakkuk describes God this way. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. God has made it clear that the soul who sins will die. And so as believers, then we should hate sin. As God hates sin. We are sons of the light and sons of the day. If you're a child of God, you should hate darkness you should hate sin and you should love the light we don't belong to the night or to the darkness first thessalonians says we must recognize that god has set us apart as a holy nation a people belonging to god we can't become holy on our own brethren when god gives us his holy spirit to sanctify us we have his promise that he will help us in our struggle against sin. Don't try to do it on your own. And so the main reason in writing this letter is that we may not sin. But thank God that our battle against sin, in that battle we have hope. And that's what verse one says, we have an advocate with the father. We have an advocate. An advocate is a person who comes to our aid or pleads our case to a judge. Advocates or offers support and strength and counsel and intercedes for us when necessary. The Bible says that Jesus is an advocate for those who have put their trust in him. My little children, I'm writing these things to you that you sin not, but or and. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. In other verses, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit our advocate. In John 14, at least in John 15, at least in John 16, four times the Holy Spirit is called an advocate. The English word advocate has been translated from the Greek word parakleton, or from the root word parakletos, which in Greek means helper a teacher, counselor, or advisor. And so we have an advocate inside of us, the Holy Spirit, who intercedes for us in prayer with groanings which cannot be uttered. The Holy Spirit who teaches our spirit how to pray because we do not know how to pray as we ought. The Holy Spirit who provides for us the prayer requests, the petitions that God wants from us. The Holy Spirit guides our prayers into offering up those petitions and those requests and those praises. And he teaches us how to worship in spirit and in truth. We have this wonderful 
Holy Spirit, who is God himself, inside of us to provide all the spiritual intercessions and spiritual uh, activities and operations that we need to engage in that he has commanded us to do in worship publicly and privately and prayer publicly and privately and all the spiritual activities he's commanded us to do the holy spirit as long as we sufficiently prepare and trust the lord jesus to provide a measure of the spirit to do he will guide us and help us to engage in all those spiritual activities he's called us to do isn't that wonderful that we have the holy spirit in such a way so that we're not left to kind of fake Christianity, try to try to stir up some kind of spiritual ability in our own strength? No, that's called legalism. That's called the works of the law. That's called religiosity. That's called re religious flesh trying to work itself up in some kind of euphoria that would that God would accept. No, we need the help of the Holy Spirit, and He's given us the Holy Spirit to dwell inside of us to do that. And we need to be spending more time building up the, the, the presence and the power and the work of the Holy Spirit inside of us instead of grieving the Holy Spirit and quenching this glorious, wonderful work of the Spirit through sin and not dealing with sin and not repenting of sin every single day, which hinders our fellowship with God and diminishes and spoils and quenches the work of the Holy Spirit inside of us. But also we have another advocate. And of course, our text identifies that advocate and he is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now in a human court system, an advocate speaks for the rights of his or her client. We call them lawyers because they have studied the intricacies of the law and can navigate through those often complicated statutes with accuracy and precision. That's the picture John paints here in 1 John when he refers to Jesus as our advocate with the Father. God's law pronounces us guilty on all counts. Even as Christians, we break God's law so many times, even when we don't realize it. And we have violated God's standards. We've rejected his right to rule over us. We become weak. We, we forget. We backslide. We commit all kinds of sins that bring us into a place of lukewarmness and forgetfulness and deceitfulness. And therefore, God judges us. That is, he chastises us. The lost the unsaved, he's going to condemn them and cast them into hell. But we're talking about Jesus who stands up and speaks up for us, who represents us, who communicates on our behalf as our heavenly lawyer, our advocate to the Father. We need him. I need him. I need him to see my tears and my sorrow for sin and my repentance as imperfect as it is, I need to, him to perfect it and to present them to the Father as perfect when I fail and when I come as imperfect as I am as a believer, but I'm sincere and I mean it in my heart when I confess my sins. And God says, if we confess our sins in verse nine of chapter one, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If the blood of our advocate has been applied to our hearts and our lives through faith, faith in his promise to forgive and to cleanse and wash through his blood and confess him as Lord, he pleads our case with our righteous judge who accepts the pleas and the intercessions and the advocacy of our high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you praise the Lord tonight for the Lord Jesus Christ? When he died on the cross, there is no debt left for Jesus to pay on our behalf. And so as our attorney, when he prays for us as Christians, he's already paid the sin debt. He's already filled up what, what we lack in our Christian 
strength, which there isn't much, he already perfects us. He's already perfected us. He's already forgiven us. He's already washed us from all the pollutions of sin. He's already sent forth his spirit to speak peace to our hearts. And the Father, based on the mediatorial advocacy of our Lord Jesus Christ, hears the prayer of our advocate, our lawyer, Jesus. And he restores all of the lost, diminished comforts that we previously knew in the peace of God, with the love of God, and the grace of God, and the joy of the Lord. Oh, my friends, though we live in a wicked world and we struggle with remaining corruption, with such an advocate in heaven at the right hand of the Father in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with such an advocate of the Holy Spirit who knows how to teach us to pray and helps us pray and grants us fresh repentance, fresh sorrow for sin, and is able to help us return to the Lord so that the Lord will return to us with fresh power, fresh life, fresh light and fresh love. How can we go wrong even though we live in a land and in a world of such wickedness? We have two intercessors and advocates, the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is perfect, who is God. And since the Bible says, greater is he that is within you, the Holy Spirit, than he that is within the world, uh, Satan and Nothing shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. How can we grow wrong, even though we will suffer and the battle will grow hot and heavy very, very often? Can somebody, can somebody say amen? So, amen. so I plead with you tonight. In your mind's eye, by faith, Based on this promise of an advocate, no matter how many times you have sinned, we have an advocate. And who is he called? Jesus Christ the righteous. God never, listen to this. You ready for this? God never attaches an attribute and a characteristic and a trait of God to himself unless he wants to emphasize the absolute fulfillment of a promise he gives. And when he describes our advocate Jesus as righteous, he could have chosen a thousand different traits or, or um, characteristics, attributes. He could have said Jesus Christ, the, the compassionate, or Jesus Christ, the holy one, or many others but he chose to say Jesus Christ, the righteous. Why did he choose that? Because in verse one, which is a linchpin verse for the book of first John, to be able to put forth a guarantee to the people of God that this promise in chapter two and verse one and in all the other promises that guarantee we will be brought back to a place of healthy, vibrant fellowship in our relationship with God if we sin. He wants to underscore irrevocably the truth that Jesus Christ is so righteous, so just, so ethical, so morally perfect and truthful in his righteousness that he cannot lie. He is Jesus Christ, the righteous. He cannot lie. He has never lied and he never will lie. So when he promises you that if anyone sin, we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. You can take it to the bank. It's a promise that will be fulfilled if you trust him to keep his promise. Will you do that tonight as we now close? What is holding you back? Go back as far as you can need to go in your, let's say, let's say you're in a backslidden condition. Go back as far as you can go. Have you been backslidden for a day, a week, a month, a year? Have you not plumbed the depths of your soul? 
in searching your heart and bringing forth true repentance from every sin which has so easily beset you. And you need to go back a year as, as shameful as it is, as much as you hang your head in grief and sorrow over the fact, yes, Pastor Joe, it's been a couple of years, a few years, five years, even 10 years since I really thoroughly was purged and cleansed from all unconfessed, unrepentant sin. Let me tell you, go back as far and as, as far as you need to go because we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous, who will, who will keep his promise to cleanse you of all sin and bring you back into the land of the living, bring, bring you back into a place where you can come boldly before the throne of grace and find grace and mercy to help in your time of need without holding your head in shame. You can come boldly into the holy of holies, to the holiest place through the blood of Christ and find acceptance and find a hearing before your father and mine who has already forgiven you of your sin. How far back do you need to go? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Trust him. Trust him to cleanse you because you have an advocate who loves you, who will not fail you, who will never leave you nor forsake you. And so come to the Lord Jesus as we close the study out in prayer. As I'm going to ask Pastor Owen, are you still with us? If you are a believer. Yes, I am. Okay, Pastor Owen, stand by. If you are a believer and you know you're saved, but you've been struggling, there's a reason why we're studying 1 John. And this is the reason why, to remind you of this glorious promise of our Lord Jesus Christ's advocacy. Stop looking at yourself now. Come out of yourself Come out of the doubts. Come out of the sorrow for a second and look to Christ, the advocate who is perfect, who has died in your place, who has borne your sins in his own body on the cross to sanctify you, to cleanse you, to cause you to return to the Lord you already know and love. Look to Christ, not how you feel. Do I feel good enough? Forget about how you feel. It's not about you. It's about Christ, what he did for you on the cross. Not about our works or how we feel. Look to Christ. Trust in him. Come right now as Pastor Owen will lead us in a closing prayer. Say yes to the Lord. However much, forget about how you feel. Forget about, come to him as you are. Don't wait until you feel like it. Come now if he is speaking to your heart. Let's go to him in prayer. Pastor Owen. Lead us in prayer, please. Father, we thank you for the study tonight as we think of repentance. And I, I can't help but thinking of Psalm 51, that, that great psalm of repentance when David, who, who committed the most grievous sins and, and then covered them up for, for months. Um, and yet he said when he kept silence, uh, his, his bones waxed. Uh, old, his his inner voice of his conscience just constantly bothered him. Um, and but yet he knew and and manifested that true repentance, asking that you would create within him a clean heart and renew that right spirit within him and restore the joy of your salvation. Um, and then you did that, and he was so much more blessed and uh, knew that tremendous fellowship with thee. And because it was true repentance, he had that full assurance of faith. Because it was it was true repentance, he, he was not not groveling in some legalistic um, works religiosity, as as Pastor alluded to. But it, it was genuine. It was heart religion. And and each of us want the the genuineness of heart religion, where um, you help us uh, do that work of repentance. It's not the flesh. It's not carnal carnal man. Um, Father, we thank you for what, what a great provision that you have made for your people to repent of, of the sins that so easily um, uh, 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 sidetrack us, the, the, the cares, the lukewarmness, all these things that, that want to crowd out the, the precious life of, of uh, Christ in us. 
Father, as Pastor Joe said, if, if there's any tonight that need to, to make things right with you, we pray you would send the Holy Spirit to them and, and convince them that this is the way that they should walk in and that they could walk in it, uh, knowing that that is your will for their life uh, from the word of God, even as it was expounded to us tonight. Thank you for such a great salvation. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.